Hey everyone, long time no see. Sorry about that. Turns out doing a PhD is hard sometimes, and for the last few weeks I've been really wrapped up in all of the prep work for my field research this summer, so I haven't really had time to do anything other than like sleep, eat, and do research stuff. So um, here I am back again, <laughs> ready to make new videos for you. While I was busy doing research, specifically prep for some of the materials for my field project this summer, one of my undergrads asked me a really interesting question. She wanted to know where the ideas for research projects come from, and I thought it was a really good question, so we spent a long time talking about it, and I explained to her, at least from my limited experience, what the basic process seems to be. I realized that my explanation to her would probably make a useful video for all of you, so here we are. I'll start by reminding you all that my experience falls squarely within what I call field ecology research. So if you're considering another kind of biology research like lab biology or a different kind of STEM research like chemistry or physics, your results may vary. But in my few research project experience so far between my master's and my PhD, these are what I consider to be sort of the main types of processes to go about developing a research project. The three main components of of a field ecology research project are the question or idea that you're actually trying to investigate or answer, the field site or sites where you'll be going to actually collect your samples and your data, and also the funding that you use to purchase materials and supplies, reimburse mileage, pay your field assistants, and maybe even use to help pay for the process of publishing your final research paper, because research publication is expensive. We've talked about that before. Professional research scientists, especially in academia, do a lot of reading of scientific papers. We do it in order to gather background information to write our own papers and also just do general reading to sort of keep up with the newest advancements in our fields. So one way that you can develop a research project is by noticing gaps in the literature you're reading. By gaps, I basically mean ideas or questions that are sort of hanging out there but that haven't yet been addressed by someone else in the literature, at least not as far as you can find. That means you don't see any papers published where someone has already done an experiment or some sort of investigation to try to answer this question, or maybe they've done it but not in your study system or with your study organism or something like that. Um, so these gaps are a great place to start thinking about your research questions. While you can find gaps in the literature or established knowledge just by reading papers broadly, one of the best and fastest ways to find gaps in scientific knowledge is by reading review papers. A review paper is basically when a researcher or a group of researchers collects up all of the papers and articles that have been published on a particular topic, and then they sort of summarize the results from all of those papers. So they find all of the places where those papers agree, where they might disagree, and where they all seem to have sort of like stopped or not gone in their investigations. Those places where they stopped or haven't gone yet are the gaps, and those are great things for you to pursue in your own research projects. If the research question or idea is your starting point when developing your research project, then you'll have to find access to a field site or field sites for you to collect your data, and you'll also have to do something called writing grants, which is basically where you write lots of really fancy reports proposing your project and then asking people to please give you some funding so that you can do said project. The second way that I've noticed seems to be a good approach to developing a research project is by forming a relationship with a land manager or some sort of stakeholder who has access to a good field site and wants to give you access to that field site in order to do research. This sort of relationship can be really awesome for building some sort of long-term or intensive research project where you just focus in on that particular field site or sites and do a lot of research there. The example that I have for this method of developing a research project is what I did for my master's. My master's project was actually one small component of a very large research project being done at the Nechusa Grasslands where the two head research 
researchers had developed a relationship with the land managers and then written a grant to get funding to do this long-term intensive sampling where we were studying dung beetles and ground beetles and small mammals and birds and all kinds of other things that all live in that particular prairie area. If you're starting to develop your research project from the point of having a field site, then of course you'll need to do lots of background reading to figure out what sorts of questions haven't yet been answered about things in that field site, and then you'll still have to go through the process of writing grants to ask people for money so that you can do the research. It's kind of unfortunate, but I bet you've already noticed that like research doesn't move forward if you don't have money, which is a bummer because that means sometimes really good research doesn't get done if the person or persons can't find the money. But an incredibly rare, at least in my experience, way of going about starting a research project is by being approached by someone, a stakeholder, who wants to give you money to do research and then sort of lets you figure out the rest. The example I have for this method of research project development is actually the project I'm working on right now for my PhD dissertation. My research group was approached by a stakeholder who has both money and specific field sites and they were interested in having us do some science in them. They were fairly vague about what they wanted with only a few sort of guidelines for their research interests and then they kind of let us do the rest. So in this case we got both the site and the funding at the same time, but you could conceivably just get the funding and then have to find the site and in both cases you still have to do the background reading to come up with the research questions after you've found the gaps in the literature. So basically, as far as I can tell at least, every research project starts with you having or getting one of those three components and then having to find or receive the other two in order to do the research project. So it makes this nice sort of triangle of components. You start with one, you need the other two. Once your triangle is complete, you get to do the research project. This was a super casual kind of informal explanation of how research projects are born <laughs> based on the conversation I had with my undergrad the other day. I hope it was helpful to all of you, but if you'd like to hear more about how research works or you have specific questions, please put them down in the comments. I'd love to give you more insight into what I do and how I do it, and I like sharing this kind of stuff with you folks. If you liked this video, don't forget to like it. If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. Then you can go check out my Patreon page. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram, where I'm trying to post more regularly, especially now that it's field season. There should be lots of cool, like, flowering insect pictures happening soon. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.